Hi, everyone. Welcome back to 3 News Now. I'm Stephanie Haney. It's Wednesday, February 3rd. Thanks for being here for your top headlines from WKYC.com and our WKYC app. We start off today with two area police departments looking for help from our community. First off, Cleveland police are looking for help locating a missing 12-year-old girl. Her name is Miana Jackson, and she was last seen yesterday on February 2nd at around 3 p.m. on West 88th Street by relatives. She's about 5 foot 10 inches tall and weighs about 110 pounds, according to a police report. She has short black hair and hazel eyes, and relatives say she might also be wearing a silver necklace with a heart-shaped charm. We have her photo up on WKYC.com and in our WKYC app if you'd like to take a look at that and see if you might have any information to help the Cleveland police. If you do, please contact investigators at 216-623-5118 or 216-621-1212. Three, four. Those phone numbers are also on WKYC.com. And in Cuyahoga Falls, police are offering a reward as the search continues for the driver responsible for a 2020 fatal hit and run incident. This was on February 2nd, 2020, when Cuyahoga Falls resident Robert Persinger was out for a walk and he was hit and killed by a vehicle that fled the scene. It happened at 2nd Street and Grant Avenue. This was around noon. Now, here's what's different about this reward situation. The police are offering what they call a significant reward award for information to help lead to a successful arrest and indictment of people involved in this fatal hit and run. Now, the city of Cuyahoga Falls Police Department has never before offered an award for this type of a crime. I called the police department to ask them what they meant by a significant award. They didn't want to give details about a particular amount, but it is a combined effort between the city of Cuyahoga Falls and the Cuyahoga Falls Crime Fighter Tip Bureau. So, if you have information, please contact the Cuyahoga Falls Crime Fighter tip line at 330-971-8477, and those tips can be left anonymously. Taking a look at the political stage and particularly how that impacts us here in Ohio, we know that Senator Rob Portman unexpectedly announced that he'll be retiring from the U.S. Senate. He will not be seeking re-election in 2020. For in 2022 for the upcoming 2023 term. And that has people wondering what the Democratic Party might do to try and make a play for that Senate seat. So now conversations are being sparked about whether the party should focus on gender and racial diversity in order to potentially win back that seat. Some people who are in the running include Dayton Mayor Nan Wiley, Nan Whaley, excuse me, who is a white woman, and she says that as a Democratic Party that they've done the same thing over and over again, which is to run white men, and it hasn't been successful. The mayor went on to say, I think we have to offer something different, and I think that's important, whether that's people of color on the ticket in a meaningful way and women. You know, we are the base of the party, and we shouldn't be an afterthought. Other people who have been brought into consideration include Dr. Amy Acton, the former Ohio director of our Ohio Health Department, and also current U.S. Representative Tim Ryan. Now, some people are saying the fact that Joe Biden was elected president as a white man but lost Ohio by eight points this year is a sign that the Democratic Party needs to do something different if they want to be competitive for that Senate seat coming up in that election. Ohio's State Representative Thomas West, who is chairman of the Ohio Legislative Black Caucus, said this, Ohio does need to shake it up, and this race will dictate where we go in the future. And he said that his caucus is working to recruit a black candidate for that U.S. Senate seat. So some black candidates who are potentially in the running include Franklin County Commissioner Kevin Boyce, who is a former state treasurer, and also U.S. Representative Joyce Beatty, a five-term congressperson from Columbus, and Ohio House Democratic leader Amelia Sykes. We will keep you updated as we learn more about people who throw their name into the ring and what any members of the Democratic Party happen to say about where they think that nomination might be going, as well as members from the Republican Party and the person that they might put forward. Rob Portman did say that the reason he made the announcement now was that he could position someone who would run on the Republican ticket to be very successful for a statewide race. 
Now we have an update from the Centers for Disease Control about schools reopening safely, and the director says that it can be done without vaccinating teachers. Director of the Centers for Disease Control, Dr. Rochelle Walensky, is talking about this while citing data that shows that social distancing and wearing a mask significantly reduce the spread of the virus in school settings. White House COVID-19 coordinator Jeff Zients called on Congress to pass additional funding to ensure schools have the resources necessary to support reopening. And President Joe Biden does include a significant amount of funding in his $1.9 trillion stimulus package, $170 billion to be exact, with much of that, all but $35 billion of that geared towards schools reopening safely. And he also has pledged to make sure that all K through eight schools reopen for in-person instruction in the first 100 days of his administration, which would be a tall task based on what we've seen here in Ohio. Now let's take a look at the latest numbers from the Ohio Department of Health for COVID-19 here in Ohio. The total number of cases in the last 24 hours, according to the Ohio Department of Health, 3,991. That's up from yesterday. And right now, the total number of cases that have been reported for COVID-19 since the beginning of the pandemic, 902,736. So that number bringing us up over 900,000 for the first time here in Ohio. And in the last 24 hours, 94 new deaths have been reported related to COVID-19. That's down a bit from yesterday and bringing the total number of deaths we've seen so far here in Ohio to 11,336. As for the daily positive rate for tests, the most current data we have comes from Monday, where 11.3% of the COVID-19 tests came back positive. That's the first time we've been over 10% here in a little while. And the seven-day average continues to stay at 8% as that number has bounced around. In the last 24 hours, we've seen 214 new COVID hospitalizations, and right now there are 2,379 people who are actively in the hospital. This is the second day in a row we've seen that number below 2,500, and according to Governor Mike DeWine, what we need to see in order to cancel the curfew here in the state of Ohio is seven days where that number is below 2,500, so this marks day two in a row. Right now, 627 people are in the intensive care unit being treated for COVID. We've seen 36 new ICU admissions in the last 24 hours. And right now, out of all the hospital beds in the state, 28% of them are available for people who need inpatient treatment for anything. Now let's take a look at the national and the global COVID-19 numbers. These numbers come from Johns Hopkins University. The total number of cases that have been reported across the U.S. is now at 26 million 478,930, and the total number of deaths across the U.S. is now at 448,337. Since we spoke yesterday, that is 4,001 new deaths across the U.S. With 4% of the global population, the U.S. leads the total percentage of cases and the percentage of deaths by a wide margin. We have 25.4% of the global COVID-19 cases and 19.8% of the global COVID-19 deaths here in the U.S. alone. Globally, the total numbers are 104,142,856 cases reported and 2,260,683 deaths reported. Now, with the Super Bowl coming up on Sunday, COVID-19 protocols are at the forefront of NFL news again because two players for the Kansas City Chiefs, who will be taking on the Tampa Bay Buccaneers on Sunday in Super Bowl 55, have now been placed on the COVID list. This is after the Chiefs brought a barber into the facility to give haircuts. This was during the off week after the Chiefs won the game to advance to the Super Bowl. So that means that wide receiver Demarcus Robinson and center Daniel Daniel Kilgore have been placed on the COVID list. Now, according to NFL Network's Tom Pelissero, neither of them have tested positive, but they are deemed to be close contacts of this barber who came into the facility who did test positive for COVID-19. Here's what we know about that. The barber had tested negative five consecutive days in a row, but then he came to the facility and was in the middle of cutting hair at the facility when he was informed that a rapid test had come back positive for COVID-19. He was cutting Kilgore's hair at the facility. Then he later told the NFL officials that on the day before that, he had cut Robinson's hair, not at the facility. So right now, 
the players can't practice. But if they do continue to test negative consecutively leading up to the Super Bowl, they might be on the field for Super Bowl 55. So we'll have to watch and see how that develops and if there are any more people associated as close contacts or uh, positive cases in the Chiefs organization leading up to Super Bowl 55. Here in Cleveland, Cleveland Cavaliers guard Colin Sexton is talking about his rise to stardom in an essay for the Players' Tribune. This is his third season in the NBA, and he has emerged now as one of the league's top scorers. Through 16 games this season, he's 22 years old. He's averaging 24.1 points. That's the 16th most in the league and the 10th most in the Eastern Conference and has helped lead Cleveland to a surprising 10 and 11 start when some people had already been counting out the Cavaliers. So here's what Sexton says in his essay. He says uh, when he was in high school, he knew his name wasn't in the kinds of conversations it should be in. So the summer between his sophomore and his junior years of high school, he knew his offers could be better. So what he did was he really focused on his time that summer in the European Youth Basketball League. And he said by the end of that summer, he was scoring a record of almost 32 points per game. And this is going into that league completely unranked. Now, his big coming out moment in the NBA was during the Cavs victory over the Brooklyn Nets last month when they won 147 to 135 in double overtime. And he scored a career high 42 points against a team that has Kevin Durant, James Harden, and Kyrie Irving. But as much attention as he got for that, Sexton said it was very much a team moment. He said, for me, that moment, that was a we moment. That was the night we went out there together as a group and let everyone know it's time for the Cavs to be on your radar. It's time to start paying attention to Cleveland basketball again. But he also said this. He said, what's funny about that moment is it was almost history repeating itself. He said, beating the Nets and putting up my career high and everything and kind of taking people by surprise like that, it almost felt like I was back in those European youth showcases, felt like I was back to turning heads as a no-name prospect, having the world act like I flipped this switch overnight. So for people who might be surprised about Colin Sexton, Colin Sexton is not surprised that he is performing in the way that he is. Now, turning to a former Cavalier, LeBron James, he coined a new term on social media, the term courtside Karen. This was after a game on Monday night in Atlanta against the Atlanta Hawks where the Los Angeles Lakers ended up winning, but the game stopped for a moment when things got a little bit out of hand. Security had to come down courtside because James got into a dispute with some of the fans, and he said it was no big deal. He said it was a back and forth between two grown men, as you put it, and then someone else jumped in. Well, that's that someone else was Juliana Carlos, who is the wife of Chris Carlos. Now, here's what James said about the whole situation. He said, at the end of the day, I'm happy fans are back in the building. I miss that interaction. We as players need that interaction. But they ended up getting kicked out because there was some heckling happening between LeBron James and Chris Carlos. And then Juliana jumped in to her husband's defense. But here's the kicker. When she jumped into her husband's defense, she stood up, her mask was down, and she was yelling at LeBron James from the side of the court. Now, the Hawks are only one of nine teams in the league who allow fans at games. And a team spokesperson told 11 Alive, which is one of our sister stations, that the arena is seating at 8% capacity, about 1,300 fans. They are enforcing COVID guidelines. And that fans who sit within 30 feet of the court have to take a COVID-19 test prior to the game and also answer a questionnaire related to potential exposure. But when Juliana Carlos got excited and started shouting at LeBron James, she took her mask off to yell at him. That's a no-no, and that got them ejected from the game. So on Tuesday, Juliana got on Instagram, and she started a post about last night. Now, you know when an Instagram post starts with about last night, it's either going to be something great because it's an amazing memory or something not so great. In this case, it was something not so great. So here's what she said about it. She said to say things escalated quickly is an understatement. She wanted to apologize for losing her cool and removing her mask. She said her husband is a huge sports fan and they're passionate people. And she said, let's be real. Sports wouldn't be sports without a little trash talking. Sure, a little bit of trash talking. But in a COVID world, when you're that close to the players, you can't be pulling down your mask to yell at people. It's just not safe. She went on to say, what should have been a quick back and forth between two adults got out of hand and my natural instinct to stand up for the man I loved kicked in. Did I get defensive when that happened? Yes. Did I use offensive language when I could have taken the higher road? Yes. And for these things, I take full responsibility. And unfortunately now for Juliana, 
she has been named courtside Karen. And that seems like something that's probably going to stick. That seems like one of those things that sticks with you for a little bit. But nice that she's taking responsibility there and apologizing for what turned out to be an escalation at that game on Monday. Now, here's one more story before we go about a young lady who took her time with LeBron James to shine in the spotlight in a very different direction. I'm talking about Arielle Turner. She's a sixth grader at the I Promise School in Akron. And in August of 2019, she got an opportunity to interview LeBron James. And when she was doing that, she had on a T-shirt that said, We Are Family. Now, that is a slogan from the I Promise School. And it was a tie-dye design that she created herself. Well... Some teachers took notice of that. Her teachers, Ms. Arnett and Mrs. Wharton, saw the shirt. They loved it. They put in orders. That kind of started catching fire in the school, and more and more people were putting in orders, and it turned into a business for her, Ariel Creations LLC. And things were getting off to a good start, but then the pandemic hit, and that kind of slowed things down. Well, during a recent car parade, Turner was surprised with boxes of shirts, paint, cry cut products which are if you're in the crafting world you know that is a pretty great machine that everyone seems to be raving about you can talk to our own romney smith about that she's got a cry cut machine that she absolutely loves and also anything that you could think of to make tie-dye shirts possible so her business is now being supported and the school and ariel said thank you to lebron james and walmart from ariel's creations Pretty incredible there, taking that moment and turning it into a business opportunity and only in the sixth grade. Definitely a bright future there. That's it for your three news now update for Wednesday, January. January. No, it is not January. It is February. We are not going back in time. Wednesday, February 3rd. I will see you next up on What's New at 5 p.m. with your trending stories in the Clicking in Cleveland segment. We also have a poll out on the WKYC Twitter page, and we want to know what you think about sending kids back to school without the teachers and staff being vaccinated. I'll be including your comments about that in the segment in the 5 o'clock show. So let me know what's going on there and I'll retweet that as well so you can find that there at underscore Stephanie Haney. All right everyone enjoy the rest of your afternoon stay safe and be well I'm Stephanie Haney.